When Scott got in, right towards the end, I was thinking, wow, I thought the, the first two presentations have been excellent, but the, the economic implications as to what he was talking about. And we're going to spend some time this morning, I'm going to spend a little bit of time going through types of things that come in as we're doing an economic type of analysis. Cost of disease, budgeting out cost of disease, taking a look at prevention versus treatment because as, as we're making decisions, one decision might be, yeah, this is a, a good uh, type of animal health problem we may want to try to prevent. Uh, this is an animal health type of problem I can very effectively manage and treat uh, if I do happen to uh, get the disease. So taking a look at disease management, spend a little bit of time looking at trends and pulling some of the information from the, the recent, uh, recent being 2005, NOMS, National Animal Health uh, uh, System, and then take a look at PERS and the economic of PERS. Uh, uh, Dale had that uh, number up there, 500 to 700 million dollars, PERS costing annually. And uh, we'll take a look at that as to what the national and uh, numbers look like. Uh, that study was done back in about 2005. That study was done when the feed cost was a little bit different than what it is today and what it, especially what it was about a year ago. So we have uh, figured some numbers with respect to uh, what PERS is costing under higher feed price and I'll make some comments with what I think PERS might be costing today with incidence levels as they are today versus uh, when we did the study in the past. Getting back to what Scott was talking about and air filtration, you know, is with animal health and a lot of the decisions, there's different types of things, and it came out in Dale's presentation as well. Uh, there are decisions that sort of stack up as we go along. And Scott had mentioned with air infiltration and you can double filtrate and that sort of thing, and each one of these is a different type of decision. Uh, that one is looking at, and one thing that really intrigued me is he was talking about these systems that are, uh, were filtrating the air is the worker attitude. That's important, isn't it? The worker attitude. And you've seen what happens to worker attitude when you get a disease outbreak like PERS and there are dead sows, there's dead pigs, and all of a sudden the reproductive efficiency in a sow herd has gone from 85, 90 percent down to 70, 65 percent. And the impact that has on the attitude, and that attitude carries through with the intensity with which the employees are doing their job and the operation. So there's a lot of economics there as well with work, worker attitude, and there might be some worker health types of things there too, where the insurance premiums for health insurance policies for the industry with air infiltration may be less than if you do not have air infiltration. So there's a lot of things there that uh, go across and have economic impact on the employees as well as the animals that are in the system. So uh, I think it's quite, it's quite interesting with what Scott is doing and some of the implications that's going to have on the industry. Production impacts, we'll spend a little bit of time on those first. Some of the first uh, things I think we'll go through a little bit quickly and then get to the economics and some of the dollar signs. But just taking a look at economics of animal health. And then we'll take a look at applying it to PERS. <clears throat> Looking at production efficiency and things that affect the economics, death, damage can be permanent. It may not be permanent. It may be uncompensated growth interruption. We may have reduced feed efficiency. All of these uh, come through and affect abortion, reproductive inefficiencies, decreased animal product output, increased culling. And we saw a lot of these as we looked at the PERS study that we looked at. Decreased animal product output, lower pigs per litter, reproduction inefficiency, breeding problems that came into the herd, and there were abortions coming in. Costs of disease, we can break those down as mortality, morbidity, and revenue loss. And with mortality, well, a dead pig isn't worth too much, is it? 
and we have expenses with respect to feed, veterinary costs, that sort of thing that has gone into that pig up to the time that that animal died, regardless of the type of animal, but pig in this particular case, and we've got disposal costs. That if the animal had not died, we would not have. Morbidity, things that are in there, the animal survived, but it is costing us because the, uh, the disease impact is causing things to the animal and it may have production impacts coming through with efficiency in that. And it's certainly going to uh, impact the cash flow, isn't it, as we go through. And revenue loss, lower weight and value, and condemna uh, condemnations in that. Feeder pig producer, PERS positive pig versus a PERS negative pig. What type of system is it going to be going into? Is it going into a system that's PERS positive? Is it going into a system that's PERS negative? And we'll be looking at some information, looking at the economic impacts of pigs coming from going into different types of systems so that there might be some premiums that you can afford to pay or try to receive yourself if you're producing those pigs and they're going into another system uh, based upon the disease that those pigs possibly have had and the impacts that that disease might have as the, the, those pigs grow out through their life stage. Cost of disease we can prevent, we can treat. Seed stock suppliers, market loss, reputation, goodwill. I've got a pretty good first-hand knowledge of feedstock supplier and what happens if PERS hits. I was a partner in a seed stock supplying operation, replacement uh, gilt multiplier herd to hit with PERS. Overnight, we got to know the banker a little bit better than what we knew the banker beforehand. We actually got hit twice with that operation and got a negative, and I'll talk a little bit more about it later. Uh, our equity went from 50% to 20% in a week in that operation because it hit during the time period back there in the 90s, the first one back there in the 90s, when the market hog price was 15 to 20, 18 to 20 dollars a hundred way. We had our gills contracted for $250 a piece. All of a sudden they're worth now 15 to 20 dollars a hundred way. Think what that happens to, uh, what it, impact that happens to, it, the impact it has on your balance sheet and the asset value. Well, you've got assets that are valued at $250 that are now down to $50 or less overnight. So, seed stock supplier, it can have a real dramatic economic impact for loss of market, reputation, goodwill, and that. Industry impact, the export market, consumer confidence. All we have to do is look at H1N1, right? To get an idea of what animal health issues and how it can flow through and impact the consumer and impact the export market. In the press yet today, we see H1N1 more often than what we used to, but still in parentheses, swine flu. So it, the, the press is still tying this back as swine flu so that we as consumers were tying this health problem, population, consumer level, we're tying it right back to the swine industry. And most consumers have the perception if I consume the product, I'm going to increase the chances of getting swine flu. Even though scientifically it's well proven that that's not the case. In fact, the bigger economic impact may be in the reverse direction of workers affecting the pigs and bringing swine, uh, the H1N1 into the hog production operation. But that's not what consumers perceive. And that's not how consumers are reacting. And it can have a dramatic impact on the economics of the industry. And with respect to the export market, as we open up the export market to more and more free trade, we're going to go to more and more non-economic trade barriers. Well, this is one opportunity for countries to use as a non-economic trade barrier. So that they're going to, uh, these animal health types of things are going to be coming in more and more frequently as a trade barrier. You've got this, we're not going to trade. You produce livestock in this way. 
we're not going to accept livestock produced in this way, so we're not going to trade. So non-economic barriers are going to come more and more to the front, forefront as we open up the uh, trade in the export market. <clears throat> We can look at reduced revenue, reduced cost, or increased cost, and just sort of sit back and think with respect to the animal health problem. What's it doing in terms of impacting our revenue and reducing the revenue? What's it doing in, uh, with respect to reducing our cost? And it may have some cost reduction types of things, but it's certainly probably going to have some cost increasing. Uh, the fourth part to this is increased revenue. I could not come up with an animal health problem that would increase our revenue. So we're, that's uh, not one to look at really in this particular case. This is sort of giving a view as to what are we trying to look at when we're doing an analysis of uh, an animal health type of an issue. If we look at A, that's sort of a normal growth pattern with respect to weight and age of the animal. And you're moving along and you may take a look at it, this is PERS or some animal health type of event that occurs. That animal health type of event <clears throat> causes the productivity weight gain to go down. And we might have B, <clears throat> which is basically compensating growth, so we've got the animal health event occurring here and then after we move through it, Weight goes down, well, it could die and go straight down here, but it may recover, and then it may have compensating gain and go right back to the normal growth curve. Or it may start out and just parallel where it was before, or it may actually have to where it's not going to gain as well as what it was before. Basically, with C&D, we've got increased days to market that are going to be coming through. Evaluating trade-offs of prevention versus treatment and marginal analysis, what is the value of additional uh, intervention versus its cost? So as we make decisions, how much is going to, what is it going to cost? What kind of return are we going to uh, get for it? And basically what we're looking at, we can do things that are going to increase our cost. And as we do those things, it's going to increase the animal performance or reduce our losses. So we can increase the cost, we can reduce the losses, and essentially what we're looking at is that combination right there where the losses and the cost <clears throat> come together. We can look at it at the herd level or the impact on the management, the flow system, but we need to have a focus on what the disease ca uh, causes as well as what causes it. So from the epidemiological side, what is causing it? And then if you get it, what does it cause in terms of production efficiency? <clears throat> Issues, costs of prevention, costs of treatment. What do those cost? How effective is prevention? How effective is treatment? And what's the probability of getting the disease? And how contagious is the disease? So these are things to look at as we're making disease management decisions. Bottom line, we can't afford total prevention. It's going to bankrupt us. This is one way of looking at diseases, maybe more at the industry level, but possibly at the individual producer level as well, but to identify diseases and fit them into the different areas. As far as cost to the farm, <clears throat> and when we're looking at this here, high cost, low cost, treatment effectiveness, <clears throat> treatment is very effective or it's not effective, and if we have something that has high effectiveness and high cost, we'll just go ahead and treat. Take our chances. If we get it, we'll treat because it's highly effective. If we have something, a type of disease, that if we get it, it's going to be costly and the treatment effective is low, we're probably looking at something that we put, should put into, hey, we need to try to prevent that thing and do everything we can to keep it out of the herd. 
If we have something that has low cost, high effect, we may actually just ignore it. Then if we get it treated. Or have the low cost, and we may determine that, hey, the impact is not great enough to even go ahead and treat it. Or if it's low on both things, we may try to uh, prevent or ignore. Because it essentially effectiveness is low, you may not want to take on that risk of getting it and make that decision. We can look at this also with respect to the probability of getting the disease and the cost to you as a producer. High probability, low probability. And we heard uh, reports this morning of uh, outbreaks on an annual basis and evaluating air filtration and how long can we keep it out of the system. That's really looking at the probability of getting disease is some of that information that Scott is looking at and uh, doing uh, his work there. So it's a high probability of getting disease and high cost of the farm. Again, we're going to try to prevent the disease because the high risk we're going to get it, and if we do get it, the cost is going to be pretty high. Or the cost is low, the probability is pretty high, we may treatment or prevention is sort of mixed there, but we, we need to take on the risk and treat uh, after we get it. And if it's low on both sides, just ignore it. It's not a big issue <coughs> that we're looking at. <coughs> and we can take a look at cost of treatment. <coughs> The cost of treatment, if it's high and the cost is high, prevent. Or we may treat if the cost of treatment is low and the cost of the farm is high, or here, prevent, treat, or treatment, ignore. And with these quadrants, we can just think of different diseases and try to put them into the different quadrants. And if they fit up here, it's a disease that we probably really want to take a close look at with respect to your farming operation, or we can do this with respect to the industry as well. And it might be useful for the different livestock industries to go ahead and try to do this with the different types of diseases that are in the industry and put them in different quadrants. And when you do that, you've identified the different diseases that possibly, yes, we should be spending a lot of time on, or down here, we probably don't need to spend a lot of time, we don't need to spend a lot of resources on those areas. <clears throat> Evaluating trade-offs, um, you can take a look at this. I just want to spend a little bit of time on lead to other diseases. If it leads to other diseases, treatment is less important versus prevention. Uh, a number of years ago, it was about 30 years ago, uh, we were actually working with a uh, a uh, swine producer here in North Carolina looking at, uh, it was, if I recall, pseudorabies at the time. Is what's the economic impact of pseudorabies in the herd? And we had detailed information, and pseudorabies was costing them a lot of money. The manager made an interesting comment when we visited the farm. He said, Jim, he said, I can manage this thing much easier than I can prevent it. He said, there's management strategies out there that allow me to effectively manage this disease versus if I have to try to eradicate it, it's going to be a lot more costly to me to try to eradicate this thing at this time versus just effectively managing uh, pseudorabies. Uh, we did the economic analysis. He had already done the economic analysis for us. He was exactly right. But one of the interesting things is we looked at that information and 80 to 90 percent of the pseudo outbreaks, t there was a TGE outbreak six to eight weeks before the pseudo outbreak. 80 to 90 percent of the time, TGE we feel weakened the herd and predisposed it to other types of things that were out there in the environment, and then they broke with pseudo. I think we have this going on with animal health types of issues. Uh, we may not be looking at one particular type of animal health problem. There may be a number of animal health issues that are coming there in the herd 
And all of a sudden we've got enough built up that we get a big one. The herd has stayed away from it. The herd has fought it off. So that I think leading to other diseases, and if there are things in there that uh, sort of build and lead to other diseases, we're looking at something that we need to spend a lot of time and a lot of resources into uh, preventing. <clears throat> disease management may be the key to survival. Because disease management, I think, is management. Something that we can do to try to reduce the odds that we may get that disease in our herd. And it's something that if we're really top line types of managers, it may be a competitive advantage that we have uh, in the industry. So I think it's a fairly important issue. Let's take a look at uh, some of the information that was coming out of the, uh, the NOMS uh, studies. <clears throat> That they did. This is the breeding age females culled over a 12 month period as a percentage of sow and gilt inventory. And if we look at 1990, and these studies have been done every five years through NOMS, and this is the source of the information here 1990, 43%, 41%, 2000, 37%, 38%. So we were actually reducing the culling rate in the swine herd. Look what happened in 2006. Up to 48, almost 50% culling level. And again, this is a nationwide type of survey that was done. And it surprised me that you see a number of this high. But part of it, I think, is that the industry is moving to larger and larger operations, and larger operations tend to cull at a higher rate than the medium to smaller types of operations. Now, this is breeding age females culled over a 12-month period <clears throat> as a percent. So the breeding herd, we're culling at a higher level than what we were in 2000. If we look at the percent of pigs that died during the nursery phase, 1990, 24, 23, 26, so that's been inching up, and now it's 2.9, about 3%. That's dying in the, the nursery phase. And then if we look at the grow finish, as the percentage of grow finish pigs that died during the grow finish phase, it went from 1.8 to 2.9 uh, to 3.9. Now if we look at this, we may say, boy, that's quite a jump. I suspect what this is also reflecting is the, the change in the industry to where we're, uh, we've gone more to more SEW, segregated early weaning pigs. So we don't have that nursery phase in there. So before we really jump and say, wow, I mean, that's a big increase, uh, my hunch is what's behind this information is uh, when we go to SEW, it's automatically grow finish. So we're picking up some nursery deaths that would have, would have been in the nursery death in prior years, prior time periods. So I think what we see here is part change of the, the, the peak flow in the industry, but it's also saying that, hey, it's not decreasing, it's increasing. So this is telling us in general that there are some things there that we can probably be doing just with the productivity and that uh, within the herd. Pig litter productivity <coughs> and uh, things that were going on there. Uh, still birth some numbers, 0.87 to 1.04 between 90 and 2006. Born alive, 9.5, uh, about 9.5, 10 eight. So it's, that's increased dramatically. Total born, increased dramatically. Pre-winning deaths, 1.1 one, one to 1.4. One, so we still have stillbirths going up. We have deaths going up. And the wean, 8.3 to about 9.3. So it's gone up about one pig. What would happen if we could decrease this back to where we were there, and if we could decrease this back to what we were here. You know, is that doable? Now, the industry has changed, and the type of structure has changed, so that uh, would lead to some of this, but there's probably some management types of things there that we can do to increase this back to a higher level. And you may say, hey, with the pork price the way it is now, uh, why do we want more pigs? Right? Because everybody's talking about cutting back. Well, if we increase this up to uh, 10 or 11, 
we can cut back the soil herd even more. So it's going to increase our productive efficiency uh, in the industry and it'll impact our cost of production. <coughs> Percent of sites in which PERS was diagnosed by the veterinarian or laboratory during the previous 12 months. This again is the same non survey. Between 2000 and 2006, breeding herd 16 to 18 percent of the sites that had PERS. Now if we look at this here, this is not percent of the females that were in systems that broke because the larger systems tend to break more than the smaller to medium size uh, type of systems. So the percent of the females that were in a uh, system that broke with PERS the previous 12 months would be higher than either one of these two. But trend is up with respect to PERS. Nursery pigs, trend is up. A percent of the, uh, the sites that had an outbreak in the nursery uh, operation and grow finished pigs Again, a dramatic increase in the trend that uh, broke with PERS in the previous 12 months, 2006 versus 2000. <clears throat> Percent of sites which usually vaccinated for PERS and breeding females, 37 to 27, so actually down a little bit. Percent that broke was up, but the percent that we're using vaccination is down. Wing pigs, not high, about 5%. Other sites were uh, vaccinating uh, for uh, PERS. Now let's go ahead and spend just a few minutes on the study that we did on the economic analysis with respect to PERS. Source of the information, there were 10 farms that were identified as having a PERS outbreak. The identification was made by the veterinarian that was working with the farm operation. Uh, the farm operation had detailed records, so we were able to pull off production efficiencies, what happened to pre, a per, pre, PERS outbreak, during the PERS outbreak. We had a range of producer types in terms of farrow to finish, or not farrow to finish, in terms of uh, farrowing operation from about 400 sows on up to about, uh, uh, I think it was 4,800 sows. That was on site. So we were identifying particular sites that broke. So that we had large operations, we had smaller types of operations, so we had a wide range there. And again, we tied the information in with NOMS as far as to get information on what's the population look like. Uh, these are the partners in crime that were involved with the study. Eric Newman, at the time he was uh, with the National Pork Board, uh, as a veterinarian with the National Pork Board. He now is in New Zealand uh, there with his family. Colin Johnson, uh, animal scientist uh, with Iowa State University. John Mabry uh, at Iowa State University, probably a familiar name with a number of you. Uh, Jeff Zimmerman, Iowa State, uh, who you're going to be hearing from later on this afternoon. Uh, Eric Bush, Ann Seitzinger, Alice Green, uh, those are three individuals with NOMS in Fort Collins, Colorado that were pulling off the national information uh, for us as we did the analysis. So these are the individuals that were involved with the study. A little bit of information on the uh, herds that were in the study. Uh, farm A1, number of sows, 10,200. Number of litters affected, about 24,000 litters. So that this particular farm we had information on 24,000 litters, so this was one of the larger farms that we we're dealing with. B1, I knew quite a bit about that operation. This is the one that I was uh, one of the partners, owners of this operation. It was a 1,400 sow. Uh, it was actually a, a breeding herd multiplier, gilt multiplier type herd. We evaluated it as though it was a commercial type herd when we did the analysis for this. Uh, we didn't evaluate it from a breeding herd. If we evaluated from a breeding herd standpoint, uh, the economic impact would have been much larger than what we came up with evaluating it as a commercial herd. Number of litters affected, about 1,200. Number of sows and seed was 4,000. 2,000 litters affected. This was a uh, 475 uh, sow herd. Went through a number of farrowing cycles here from the time it uh, broke until they were on top of it, 1,400. 2,800 sow herd, 1,800 affected, 1,000 sow herd, 432. That one didn't last very long. 
So the, the length of the, out, of the impact of the outbreak, as you can see by looking at this in terms of size and the number of litters affected, uh, was quite different. All the way from about two months to 28 months was the duration that the veterinarian had identified as the impact of the, uh, and having an impact on productivity from the, it, the outbreak, till the outbreak was over, it was negative and productivity was back up again. If we take a look at nursery, we actually only had two nursery sites that we had uh, uh, good information on. But number of groups affected, 40,000. Number of groups unaffected was 105,000. This one was 66 and 220. And I think I have information on this. <clears throat> number of pigs, if I recall correctly, was about 400 to 800,000 pigs. So there were a lot of pigs. I think this one was about 800,000, that was about 400,000 pigs uh, that, uh, that we were looking at affected versus unaffected. And here what we had is the operation had buildings that they were able to identify these ones broke, these ones did not. So we had the same management, the same rations, and same genetics and everything going on. And we had 40 groups that were broke, 40 did not, 66 that broke, 220 that did not. And then if we look at grow finish, uh, we had uh, five different farms. Uh, number of groups affected, 38, 109 not affected, 2, 12, and this was a smaller type operation, 12, 18, 27, and 546 affected, 356 uh, not affected as we were looking at those. Um, <clears throat> Faring productivity differences, and this is... Uh, the information by the different farms. This is the percentage change as to what occurred during the outbreak. And the farrowing rate decreased by 11 percent. And if you look down through here, you'll see that uh, there was a high degree of variability as far as how the farrowing rate changed. Pigs wing per sow farrowed. The percentage change. And pigs winged here, percentage change, as you see. And one thing this shows us is that the variability or the severity of the outbreak and the, the severity of the impacts on the productivity from an outbreak is quite wide here. And uh, Dennis Petrie, uh, Dr. Petrie, this afternoon, I uh, took a peek at uh, some of the stuff he's going to be talking about. And he's going to be talking about averages and distribution. And the mean distribution, variability. With this stuff here, it's quite variable. Quite variable meaning that it's quite risky. If it happens to be on the low side, right there, B1, B2. That I know about, because I was part owner. And when that first hit, and we had the 2.5 without farrowing rate, oh, you know, not that big a deal on farrowing rate. Look what happened when it hit the second time. Same herd. And what we did is we closed the herd down, got it negative, and we got out about 12, 12 and a half months negative. It broke a second time. Closed it again and got it negative. We got out about 11 and a half, 12, just shy of 13 months. It broke a second time. Whereas we lost our contract to be a uh, guilt multiplier herd there. So we were automatically at that stage a commercial herd, even though we were working as a commercial herd all the way through because we could not sell uh, uh, breeding livestock out of the system until we got it out a certain time with respect to negative. That's what happened the second time. That's what happened the first time. Same herd, same management, everything uh, within the operation. But that one, but here, pigs weaned per sow, even though it didn't affect the farrowing rate all that much, it sure affect the number of pigs that were coming out on pigs weaned per sow farrowed as well as per year. And if you look at that one there, down about 50% by the time everything got through the system. And you may want to change this number down here. The high, 38% uh, to me, 46% has always been higher than 38. And that, so that 
should be this number down here should be 46 percent. But if you look at the range, 2 to 39, 9 to 38, 6 to 32, there's a lot of variability there as to if you do get the disease, what's the impact on the productivity? And I think with some of these here, you know, I was coming away with the conclusion that this might be management related, but that's the same operation. And exactly the same manager and the same employees through both outbreaks. So I've got first-hand knowledge of what happens to employee attitude and morale when something like this happens. You know, it just overnight went off the cliff. And the manager of that operation, he had his hands full to get the attitude and the morale of the employees back up. Because when they're walking in there and they're in dead pace, and that it, it really impacts the, uh, the, the attitude of the operation. So this is giving some uh, look at the percentage change. This is just looking at the absolute in terms of what's going on. High, 26. And the farrowing rate went down by 26 points. As the high one only went down by two points, average about 11 points. Average about one and a half points in terms of pigs weaned per sow, about one and a half less pigs weaned per sow, and about four and a half to five pigs less per sow per year uh, during the outbreak. So these are numbers of pigs that we're getting less out of the system. We'll see those numbers again in just a minute. And if we look at grow finish nursery, average daily gain, down about 25%. Feed efficiency, down 11 to 12%. These were fairly consistent, but again, there are only two observations uh, on this one here. And the mortality percentage, 1,000%, 246%. Well, when you're dealing with something that's fairly low percent to begin with, if it changes much at all, the percentages is high. And the percentages tell us more than the absolute many times because these are some fairly big numbers here. Growth finish, 12%. As you see, though, quite variable, 40%. Impact on the average daily gain with this particular operation. And But if you look at this one here versus the rest, this one is impacting the average, which we're going to be doing economic analysis of the average. This one's impacting the average, but the variability shows us something quite different, doesn't it? Because the next highest is here, 12%. And we've got a two. A couple of them in there. So this average is probably high relative to what the overall statistics would indicate. But it is indicating it's possible because it did happen with this operation. Feed efficiency, there again, and this one really got hammered. This, the feed efficiency, and again, this here, uh, interesting, this operation J, um, the feed efficiency actually improved. Not much, but it did. But the, the pigs just weren't eating as much. So the appetite went way down and that, with this operation. And this operation had extremely good records. So uh, but first of all, we were questioning the data. But it had extremely good records. So we figured that, yeah, that's, that's uh, what actually went on with that particular, these uh, two particular outbreaks. Mortality. You can look at the percentage change there. But again, when we're looking at cross operations, it just shows that there's a lot of variability <coughs> there. And this is just the absolute differences. That's what it's showing. <coughs> okay. We start taking a look at sort of a summary of uh, what was going on of the, the, the case farms. The farrowing rate, negative group was about 80%. Went down to about 68%. There's that 11 percentage points that we were looking at before. So the overall average was about 80%. During the good times, 
It went down to about 68% during the PERS outbreak. Pigs weaned per litter. Overall average during the, the good times before the outbreak was 9.13, went to 7.63. There's your pig and a half. So it went down by one and a half pigs there. Uh, litters per sow per year went from 2.29 to 2.09. So it went down two tenths of a litter per sow per year. Nursery mortality went from 1.55 to 12.5 or 10.65. Now, to put this thing on a percentage, that's at your thousand percent here. But it is about 2 to 12. Or went up by about 10 percentage po uh, 10 points there. Girl finish mortality, 3.6 to 9.7 uh, about, or about 6 percentage points there. And if you look at that, th these are dramatic changes from the base as to the, the, the good times versus the PERS outbreak. <clears throat> Let's take a look at some of the economics as to what this was causing. Lowest impact was $27, highest was $156. Now, how much did uh, Scott indicate that some of those filtration systems cost per sow? Recall? Cheapest one was 100 230 I heard a 230 there. 156 That's one outbreak. But this is, I'll, I'll give you information on distribution in just a minute. Uh, this one's up there. Uh, that's B2. I was a proud owner of that one. <laughs> and 156 came through. We got to know the banker just a little bit better. And that sort of thing when we said, hey, well, we're losing all this money and those yields are now worth 50 bucks. They're not worth 250. Hey, Jim, what are you talking about? <clears throat> Checks in the mail. But the lowest was here. Impact per pig in the nursery, 335 to 912. And I was talking to a couple of individuals over the break. They were talking about uh, vaccination about a buck a pig. 335 to 912. Buck a pig. I guess if you know you're going to get it, that's what it's worth. But what kind of risk are you taking on financially by vaccinating versus non-vaccinating? Impact per pig grow finish, 21 cents to 28 cents, and I'd indicate both of those are a little bit of an outlier. Uh, 21 cents. That was an operation, if you would call J1, J2. Uh, if you take a look at J1, J2 and the, uh, your information there for that. Uh, same operation. Two different sets of pigs that we were able to track through, and that operation was able to tell us these pigs came into the nursery negative, so they were also negative as they went into the farrowing. Farrowing, grow finish. Got them going the wrong way. Uh, grow finish. These pigs came into the nursery as positive, and I got this wrong. Let's start over again. These pigs came into the nursery as positive, so they went on into the grow finish as positive. These pigs came into the nursery negative. They went into the grow finish negative and broke in the grow finish. Uh, these are the pigs that were positive in the nursery and were also positive in the grow finish. The impact was a lot higher for those pigs in that same system that came into the grow finish negative and broke in the grow finish. That's telling us something with what we may want to pay for pigs that are coming from a system positive or negative going into a system positive or negative. Because the pigs that broke in the grow finish and came in negative and then broke there, the impact was a lot greater. <clears throat> this is with respect to uh, economic impact PERS outbreak for selected feed cost. 250, 375, 500. And one thing that comes through here, economic impact per litter, 74 to 79, goes up about five bucks. Six dollars to 641, yeah, goes up a few pennies. 791 to 991, this is per pig. 
And when I saw this, I thought, whoa, the increased feed cost really is having an impact on the grow finish phase versus the other phases. And then you stand back and think, well, yeah, it's having an impact on average daily gain feed efficiency, and those pigs are eating a lot of feed at that time, aren't they? So that the, the feed cost change is having a bigger impact on the grow finish producer than it is on the, the nursery producer or the farrowing uh, side of it. This is looking at the overall economic impact to the industry. As we add all of these numbers together, there's your five to seven hundred million dollars. Two fifty. Now three seventy five to two thirty eight, six forty. Uh, today we're sort of in between these two. And we updated this about a year ago, or no, about a year and a half ago. We went to five bucks, and we no more than got it updated. And all of a sudden, the corn just shot right by five, and we thought we were at the top when we projected out. Uh, but anyway, it was 686. Now, the information that we used to do a herd population thing was NOMS 2000. When we did this initially, the 2005 was not available. Recall that information: 2006 versus 2005. The incidence is greater in 2006 and 2005. Using 2006 information, these numbers are greater. We're probably up to eight, 850 million impact. If the PERS incidence level today is similar to what was reported in 2005, a nonce. So we're dealing with some fairly big numbers when we look at this here. Taking a look at individual farm, and when Scott was doing his presentation, jogged my thought memory to, uh, and when I looked at Dennis's, what he's going to be talking about this afternoon. Variability. Sow. Impact per sow on the different herds. Uh, about 70 to 80 dollars. But a 45, 37, 93, 156, that's the high. 95, 57, 27, 51, 102. So you see there's a range on impact per sale. But that $100 figure is in there, isn't it? For a lot of 90s, 100 or greater. If we look at growth finish per pig, there's a 28.30, there's a 355, 328, uh, 21 cents, and a 10.41. So varies dramatically, but it drops rapidly from 28 and that 21. So those two extremes are sort of outlayers on both sides, but we're still in that $3 range, $4 range as far as impact per pig. Uh, nursery, there were only two observations there, but it was uh, 335 and 912. So quite different in that. As a summary comment. During the loss situations, and right now, if we're evaluating this sort of thing, and during animal health loss situations, you may be able to justify spending more for animal health issues than during good times. Or the reverse. It depends upon what is it causing. Why are we in difficult times? Low prices, high feed cost. And we hit a time period last year where both at the same time. But if it's low prices, things that cause productivity like reduced pigs, that sort of thing to go uh, down, not near as big of an impact, is it? If it's high feed cost, and we've got high feed cost that's causing the economic hard times, $5 corn, $6 corn, well, if that animal health issue is causing feed efficiency uh, to go down, meaning that we need to increase the amount of feed that we're using, well, the value of that feed is going up. We're in economic hard times, but also we can justify paying more to fight animal health problems that lead to a reduction 
or worse level of average daily gain. And sell that one to your banker, right? To take that one on in. Because bankers are going to be interested in cash flow. And justifiably so. And the banker is probably going to say, well, Jim, I've got a bridge, too, that I'm going to sell you. If you want to hire a bigger loan to increase your animal health expenditures when the loss per pig is 20 bucks. But really economically, yeah, we can increase our expenses and the loss per pig may go from 20 to 17. We're not making any money, we're just losing less. And that's so, you know, take a look at what is the disease causing and what's causing the economic hard times. Because it may be good times, spend less. Bad times, spend more. So with